You know, the Washington Post reported that over 250 people have died in recent years attempting to, are you ready for this? Take selfies. Died. I, you could say, at least in this case, that our desire to be seen is killing us. You know, recently kids uh, eight, to 12, 8 to 12 were surveyed about what they want to be when they grow up. Now, in decades previous, like when I was a kid, you could kind of safely predict what those answers were going to be. Okay, teacher, that was a safe choice. Doctor made the list. Policeman, firefighter, cowboy. Um, classic. My entire grade three class boys wanted to be a truck driver. You know what the recent number one choice for eight to 12 year olds is? YouTuber. Yeah, followed by musician and professional athlete. All right, you kind of sense a, a theme there. Let me, let me throw one more study at you and see if you can kind of all connect the dots in this. Uh, young non-Christians were polled and asked about the first thing that came to mind when they thought about evangelical Christianity. What do you, what do you think first came to mind? Uh, loving your neighbor, uh, serving the poor, uh, generosity or sacrifice? Is that the first thing they thought of? No. Nine. Yet. It was 91% said the first thing that comes to mind when they think of Christians is that Christians are anti-homosexual. That's a great thing to be known for, isn't it? That we're against a whole group of people. Um, Number two, 87% said that Christians are judgmental. Ouch. Number three, 85%, Christians are hypocritical. So today, I want to talk to Christians. If you're somebody who does not identify as a Christian, I I really hope you're watching. I hope you have somehow stumbled upon this or you've been invited to watch this. And I'm so glad that you're watching this. I think you'll get something out of it. But um, I'm really talking to Christians today. And And if you too think that Christians are fake and hypocritical, then... Stick around because you'll at least like the whooping that's about to happen here in a second. Now, when we as Christians sort of place ourselves in the biblical text, um, when we picture ourselves in the story, you know, listening to Jesus on that hillside 2,000 years ago, I don't know about you, but if you consciously do this or not, or unconsciously do this, it's actually a part of what we call lecto divina a slow reading of scripture and where we sort of use our our redeemed imagination to kind of place ourselves in the text. Um, But as far as the Sermon on the Mount goes, we might actually try to picture ourselves in the role of Pharisee. Nobody wants to do that. Um, But for the lifelong Christian, that is probably the biggest temptation that we would most relate to. Self-righteous, judgmental, hypocritical. I know we'd, we'd much rather picture ourselves as the hero in our story or in the story of Jesus, but maybe us church folks are a little closer to the Pharisee. Maybe, maybe especially us professional Christians, you know? like yours truly, like Chris, like Glenn. I think pastors need to be extra vigilant not to drift into holier-than-thou, phony baloney, external-only righteousness. In fact, here's kind of my scary advice for those maybe thinking of making full-time ministry your vocation. It's an honorable calling to be sure, but listen, the Christian ministry might make you a worse person than you would have been otherwise unless you resist the tendency through the power of the Holy Spirit to prioritize your external reputation over your inner 
spiritual life, okay? An authentic, vital, growing behind the scenes relationship with God. It's so primary because there is actually enormous pressure in Christian ministry towards hypocrisy. Christian leadership all the time has to be telling people, God is wonderful, Jesus changes lives, and so your heart better be in a condition where you can say it with integrity. That's what we're gonna get into today as we continue working through the most famous message that Jesus ever gave. And this week, Jesus is gonna talk about how that same instinct to be a a selfie culture, to want to grow up to be famous can, it can infect our spiritual lives. So let's jump in. If you have your Bibles, it's, it's the beginning of chapter six in Matthew, verse one, he says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. Okay, let's stop here. This is Jesus's big idea. Don't do something that's good, that's spiritual, in a way that's meant to be seen, okay? In a way that's trying to draw attention to yourself, that tries to get people to applaud you or praise you. You're not pleasing God in this way because you did it for show. You did it to get credit, and that's all the credit you're gonna get Can can I just reread it how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message? This is how he translates it. Be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. Okay, now now he's speaking my language. This will come as a surprise to literally uh, no one. But I actually spent more hours in the drama class than I did on the sports field. Does that, nobody surprised by that? No? Well, that kind of hurts my feelings a little bit, but it's true. Have you ever seen uh, these masks? Uh, I'll bet you have. Of course, they're the, the comedy tragedy masks worn uh, uh, in ancient Greece. Actually, in ancient Greece theaters, actors wore all kinds of different masks that that represented their character. All actors back then were male, and so even the female roles were played by men wearing masks. Now, trivia question. Do you know what the word was in Greek for one of those actors? Hypocrite. That was the word. The hypocrite was an actor, someone who pretends to be someone that they're not. Now, obviously, for acting, that's the goal, right? And the more you can sort of immerse yourself in the mask, the better. The mask would wrap entirely around the head. There'd be these little eye holes, little mouth hole. And the art of the actor was that from the moment he put this mask on, the entire conduct of his Demeanor changed on stage, okay? He was immersed in it. Um, I'm a bit of a movie buff, as, as some of you are. And uh, one of my favorite actors has taken the craft of being a professional hypocrite better than I think almost anybody. There's this guy, Daniel Day-Lewis. I think he's the only male actor who's won three Best Lead Actor awards. You could say he puts on the mask better than almost anyone. This is a guy who for a role, one of an early roles, he learned to speak Czech for a role. He studied it until he was fluent. I'm having a hard time memorizing 12 minutes of the Sermon on the Mount. He learned a whole other language to get into character. There's this great film, My Left Foot, where he played an Irish writer and painter who was in a wheelchair. I think he had cerebral palsy. And how did Daniel Day-Lewis go in public preparing for that role to restaurants and whatnot? Yeah, in a a wheelchair. Uh, He prepared for his role in The Last of the Mohicans by learning to track and skin animals. He actually spent some nights in jail for his role in The Name of the Father. Um, And he doesn't really like to talk about 
process too much. But I found this short clip uh, one time where he articulated a bit of his process. Watch this. That whole thing which is, tends to be spoken about on my behalf because I try not to talk about it too much, but that whole thing uh, takes on a... a um, a, a mystique which is not really representative to me of the work itself because it seems so clear to me that if I and most of my colleagues really do the same thing in different ways maybe but we we go to these great lengths to try and create a world for ourselves and within that world we try and create an understanding of the lives that we're expressing in that world and for me that's where the pleasure of the work is so what would seem crazier to me is to jump in and out of that world or in and out of the experience of that character because that's really where I want to be. Um, I guess finally there is some kind of mystery because it either works or it doesn't work and you've no idea what makes the difference but, but, um, but it's just the joy of that work really. So there's a theatrical hypocrite. I mean that in the best sense but here's what Jesus did and as far as I can tell no one had ever made this connection before with this word. He took the concept, he took this word, and he applied it to people who are spiritual actors, okay? People who um, are wearing a mask in their spiritual life. They're playing a part. It's not their authentic identity, and, and what they do, you could kind of say, is a form of spiritual theater, right? It's, it's, it's make-believe. It, it's as if they're on stage all the time in front of an audience. They do it, I suppose, for the same reason that an actor does it, to receive a applause, to receive some form of affirmation. And Jesus hated it. He didn't hate the people, but he hated the show. The, the games, the phoniness. In fact, it was this recurring theme in Jesus' ministry. Can I just read you a few more quotes from Jesus in, later on in Matthew? In Matthew 23, he says, Everything they do is for show. Hypocrites. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup. We watched that video and the dish. But inside you're filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. And now he's just warming up here. Listen to this. Hypocrites, you pretend to be holy with all your long public prayers in the streets while you are evicting widows from their homes. Hypocrites, you are like beautiful mausoleums full of dead men's bones and of foulness and corruption. You try to look like saintly men, but underneath those pious robes of your hearts are besmirched with every sort of hypocrisy and sin. So that's, that's the big idea. And then Jesus gives us very specific examples, three examples of the difference between authentic spirituality and kind of a mask-wearing spirituality. And here's what he says. This is verses 2 to 4. In chapter 6, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Here Jesus is saying there's a right way to give and there's a wrong way to give. One is authentic. One is for show. One gets the applause of heaven. Uh, one just gets the applause of men. So what's the wrong way to give? Um, it's giving, I suppose, in a way that draws attention to you, that tries to let everyone know how generous you are. I, I've known people both in sort of church and marketplace settings who will not give unless a building wing is named after them or there's a plaque on the wall or there's some sort of ribbon cutting ceremony with the media covering it. They may care about the cause, but what really excites them is the credit. 
But when all you care about is getting the credit, Jesus says, that's all the credit you'll get. And maybe what's most egregious about that attitude is that it really robs God of his honor, of his due. Because here's the truth. There is nothing that I have that has not been given to me. Nothing. My very next breath is a gift from God. There is nothing I have that didn't come to me through the ridiculous generosity of God. So whatever I give isn't really me giving. It's his resources that I've been given to manage. You know, so to try and steer the whole thing towards me is, is, is crazy. It's a God thing, not a Jonathan thing. It'd be like, you know, Lady Gaga's accountant saying that he donated a million dollars to a charity. Really? Yeah, I issued the check, signed it from Lady Gaga's account. It wasn't really your money to begin with, brother. So what's the right way to give? First of all, Jesus makes it clear that we are to give. You know, we are to be generous the way that Jesus model generosity. But Jesus says, do it in a way that doesn't draw attention to yourself, which simply means, you know, you give for the sake of giving, for the sake of generosity, not for pats on the back. Let, let's say you give to support the, the ongoing ministry of Newmark Alliance Church. You do it out of gratitude, out of obedience. You know, you whisper a prayer of thanksgiving to God when you give. You thank him for everything that he's given to you, um, everything that he's trusted to you. For you, giving is a privilege. It's, it's an act of worship. But if you brag about how much you give, you know, if you try to get preferential treatment because of how much you give, Jesus says, you miss the point. You've gone from doing something for the applause of heaven to the applause of men. But that's not the only way we can kind of screw up giving. Let's say you know someone, maybe even in our community, in our church community, who, who is short on rent. They're um, not able to pay for a car repair that's they desperately need or a bill that has come due. You want to help. That's a good thing. But do you want to do it so that you get the thank you um, or for the indebtedness that they'll feel to you, the gratitude that they'll have? You know, again, there's this whole toxic side to giving. During this COVID season, I had the privilege uh, so proud to see people at NAC who stepped up and stepped out and wanted to help people in our church community, but have their name sort of left out of it. You know, it tells you a little something about their heart, about their motivation. Let me show you this beautiful picture of giving, and it comes from the ancient early church. There's this group of Christians in Jerusalem, and they're all facing financial hardship. So this group of Christians in another city, Macedonia, sent them an offering, sent them a lot of money. Here's the thing, though. They themselves were among the poorest of the poor. You know, Jerusalem is known as the affluent church. They're the big city church. Macedonia is the yokels down the road, the country church. But Jerusalem church had fallen on hard times. And here's how it's described in 2 Corinthians. Now, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. 
you notice the spirit of that? Not a single name of an individual is mentioned. It's, it was done purely for the joy, for the privilege of giving. And, and to this day, we read about it in the Bible because to this day, God smiles on that kind of giving where their reward is in heaven. So Jesus gives a second example about the same point, really. He says, in verse five and six, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, just like Giving, He says, oh, it's so good to pray, but do it authentically. Don't do it for show. You know, there's nothing wrong with praying in public. In fact, you know, sometimes I, I wish we would step out a little more in, in our vulnerability and pray out loud in public. But if that's the only time you pray, when you're on stage or when there's an audience, Jesus says, well, that's about all that you're going to get out of that prayer. The attention you got when you prayed. So how should you pray? Well, in a way that doesn't draw attention to you, but instead focuses entirely on you paying attention to God, um, on your relationship with God, your conversation with God. Find a time maybe when everyone's out of the house uh, on a walk, perhaps, or uh, find a chair that's maybe looking out a window. Turn off the lights if you need to. Be alone with God and pray in a way that, that he would love to hear and respond to you. Could you imagine if the extent of what I communicated about my wife, Vicki, was from the stage, I told you how wonderful she is and how much I love her and how beautiful she is. And then I went home and said nothing to her. It's kind of what's going on here in this example that Jesus uses. And now I want to skip ahead in the chapter because I think this next point that Jesus makes is part of this larger point. Because he gives one more example in verse 16. He says, when you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Um, just a quick word about fasting for those who, who may not be familiar with it. Fasting is a very important, very helpful spiritual discipline. A spiritual fast is when you go without something, usually food, for a period of time in order to hone your senses for spiritual and uh, prayer sensitivity. Uh, usually you fast for a reason, something that you're praying for, a decision that you need to make. Um, maybe you fast for someone um, that you're praying for, somebody who needs to come to know Jesus or somebody who needs healing. And when you fast, every time that you consciously have to bypass what you're fasting from, and by the way, you can fast from food, but also video games, Netflix, um, you are reminded when you bypass that, not, not only what you are fasting, but what it is you are fasting about. And, and that prompts you to pray about it. It cultivates this ongoing prayer throughout the day. It's powerful. It's a very personal, spiritual discipline. But here Jesus is talking about people who, when they fast, kind of want everybody to know that they're fasting right? That they're, they're suffering for God. Oh, 
feel a little faint today, actually. No, it's because I'm fasting. But, um, you know, back in the day, they would even put ashes on their head. So, so people would be drawn to, to recognize that they're fasting. And Jesus says, don't even let people know about it. In fact, wash up and put oil on your face. That's, that meant back then that they were getting ready for a party or a celebration or a wedding. Don't even give people a hint that you're going through a deprivation. Don't do it for attention. This is an, an exhaustive list. It's the three examples that Jesus gives, praying, giving, fasting. But do you see what Jesus is after here? When you do anything at all that's related to your spiritual life, things that are designed to feed your authentic relationship with God, be authentic. Uh, we can sing songs and worship for the approval of others. I'm embarrassed to, to tell you about the times in, in youth group when I sort of raised my hands because, you know, I wanted to seem spiritual, but I was far from God. Uh, I, I think we can evangelize with selfish motivations. You, I suppose it's a matter of asking yourself in a gut check sort of way, Am I doing this in order to be a certain kind of person or to be seen as being a certain kind of person? You know, another question you might ask is, if I won't be seen doing this, would I still want to do this? Ouch. In short, are you like wearing a mask of a religious person? You know, a super spiritual person. It's a Guy Fox V for Vendetta. I did the best I could. Um, the only possible explanation I can think of that you would wear a spiritual mask is for the approval of others, for the praise of men. And that is strong motivation. Believe me, I, I get it. And there's a kind of mask today that's particularly insidious, I think, one that sort of feigns vulnerability and empathy and self-deprecation and, you know, sort of, you put on the mask of the down-to-earth every man. Um, and it's a mask because you've learned that's what is affirmed and that's what's celebrated. I was talking to a knack friend about this temptation yesterday, and I think he coined uh, a, a phrase, um, oh, what did, he, what did he call it? I'm going to look it up just real quick because it was good. Uh, strategic vulnerability. Yeah, strategic vulnerability. It's, it's a mask, or it can be. There's this old comedian, George Burns, and he used to say, sincerity is the key. Uh, once you fake that, you've got it made. Dad joke, right? But today I think Jesus is reminding us it's actually about who you are when no one is looking. I, I'm not a poetry guy, but I came across this old poem by someone named Ruth Harms Culkin. This is a, a poem for the Christian today, for the recovering Pharisee like me. It's, uh, it's simply called I wonder, and, and this is what she wrote. You know, Lord, how I serve you with great emotional fervor in the limelight. You know how eagerly I speak for you at a women's club. You know how I effervesce when I promote a small group. You know my genuine enthusiasm at a Bible study. But how would I react, I wonder, if you pointed to a basin of water and asked me to wash the calloused feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month, in a room where nobody saw and nobody knew. Hmm. None of us, I'm certain, want to be hypocrites, which raises a very subtle but important way that we can actually deceive ourselves. Um, I knew a pastor who, who asked his congregation, how many of you battle with 
self-deception. And a few hands went up. And then he asked the same congregation, um, how many of you know somebody who's really self-deceived? Almost every hand went up. It's, it's easy to see it in other people. Not so easy to see it in yourself sometimes. And um, chances are we actually might be the last to see it in ourselves, right? We, we wear the mask. And uh, what if the spiritual mask we wear for the world, we slowly, almost imperceptibly end up wearing it in the mirror too, right? The mask has become so integrated in our daily life that we, we look at the mask and we, we see what, we're, what we think we're doing as authentic. We, we look at a reflection and actually it's not who we are. Oh, to be authentic with God and authentic with ourselves. Some of you may have discovered in COVID um, a season where, you know, we haven't had much of a chance to do spiritual things publicly. Um, You may have ended up doing very little spiritual things at all. That may be a a bit of a harsh reality check for some of you um, coming to grips with that even as as I speak. And maybe you're feeling even the gentle conviction of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to you. You don't mean to be an actor. You're not wanting to be an actor. But so much of your faith has become an act. Instead of a life of intimacy, And it broke Jesus' heart when well-intentioned people donned, you know, the religious mask for the crowd. And it's especially heartbreaking when we don the religious mask for the mirror as well. Ah, that's doubly heartbreaking, I think, to God. We're not fooling him, and we may be fooling ourselves, perhaps past the point of consciously trying to deceive others, but but we're deceiving ourselves. I know none of you want this. Jesus doesn't want this for you either. So what's the real thing? What is authentic spirituality all about? It's not whether others see you pray. It's you having the kind of relationship where you can't imagine not talking to your heavenly father. It's not about whether others see you give in the offering plate. It's whether you give freely because you're so filled with gratitude at how much has been given to you. And you're so inspired with how your giving can further the kingdom of God. It's not about whether people know that you fast. It's whether there is a truly transforming presence in your life that has helped you look and sound, and act more like Jesus than you did a year ago. And none of these things, by the way, can save you. But they are the the things that naturally flow out of what is going on inside of you. I'm going to invite the band to come back up, but I feel like Jesus is saying to you today, oh, take off the mask, would you? Take off the mask and just just come be with me. I really really like you the way you are. You, You don't have to pretend. Just have a relationship with me. Can you hear him saying that to you? Can you hear him whispering that to you this morning? To the, to the one today who's, who's trying to show your best life on social media, I just want to remind you that you are not defined by your followers. You are defined by the one that you follow. Sky Jatani, the guy who writes the book that this series is sort of based on, 
says that we all want to live lives that matter. But in a celebrity-saturated culture, we've come to believe that our lives matter only if they're noticed. We want someone, anyone, to take notice, to see us, to tell us that our life counts. So in this culture, to hear Jesus remind us that what is done in secret is what matters most. That real intimacy, you know, whether with another person or with God, actually requires a measure of privacy and it shuns publicity. God is to be our only witness because he has become our only desire. So the more that we develop this intimacy with God, the less we strive for the affirmation, you know, the attention of others, including strangers on social media. We're going to discover a secret that has eluded so many others. Our lives matter. Not because someone noticed our post and pushed like, but because God is always with us and he's noticing every moment of our lives. That's the simple authenticity that God desires for us, that our worship would be simple, unadorned with showmanship. Let's worship together as we sing.